Good morning. I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for September 9th, 2022. I want to go through some headlines from the collapsing empire. Uh, the, the controllers of this empire are trying to suppress the stories that are really going on, both with its collapse and both with the alternatives which are emerging. But these alternatives have been shaped by the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche. And we have a series of activities over the next days, which will give our viewers an opportunity to participate in the shaping of this uh, potentially new situation, new strategic and financial architecture. So I wanna start with the strategic side of the collapse of the empire, because there are some very interesting headlines. Let's start with the pilgrimage of Secretary of State Blinken to Kiev, which was a surprise. He went there uh, laden with presents for the existing Ukrainian government. Uh, of course, the media is filled with stories of the great success of the counteroffensive launched by the Ukrainian military. But the reality is it's much ado about nothing unless you consider the slaughter of Ukrainian soldiers nothing. Uh, there's little that was done except a public relations operation designed to convince the West to keep funneling in arms and weapons and keep encouraging the fight against Russia. Now, Blinken brought with him three, almost, well, yeah, three billion dollars in aid, 675 million of weapons from U.S. stocks, which, by the way, are being rapidly depleted. And the U.S. is having trouble with the manufacturing capacity to restore the ammunition that it's sending over to Ukraine. And then $2.2 billion in so-called long-term investments. Not clear what that is, whose pockets that's going to line, but that was Blinken's package. Then you have the meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group in Rammstein Air Base in Germany, attended by the Secretary of Defense from Raytheon, Lloyd Austin, and General Milley of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, Austin said the U.S. will continue to provide weapon systems, uh, aid to Ukraine. And this, of course, is the same place where the first contact group meeting took place, where Austin declared that the intent of the Western support for Ukraine is to weaken Russia's economy and degrade their military. Well, in the meantime, it's shooting the Western economies in the head. Uh, another example of this is NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, who wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times, in which, which was titled, NATO will pay the price, but we must stay the course in Ukraine. And he sheds crocodile tears for the suffering that's being imposed on the NATO member nations and its population. But then he said, this is necessary to live up to a moral responsibility to stand up to tyranny. Well, a moral responsibility to support democracy in a government which is shutting down opposition leaders, shutting down opposition parties and press, which is threatening to kill people on a hit list that's been put out by the Ukrainian Defense and National Security Council, that's standing up to tyranny. I think Stoltenberg is upside down and a little bit deranged in statements such as that. Then finally, <clears throat> in the world of the insane, we have the European Union Energy Plan, which is to bail out energy speculators and derivatives markets, protecting spot market swindles while demanding mandatory targets for cuts in energy consumption of the population. One note on this, there were large demonstrations last weekend in Prague, some say 70,000 to 100,000 people in the streets protesting both the sanctions policies, the support for Ukraine and, and so on. As a result, the Czech government has proposed suspending derivative transactions on Dutch spot markets. Now, this is expected to be vetoed by the European Union leaders, but it shows that showing up in force has an effect on governments, <coughs> as we've seen also <coughs> excuse me, with Dutch farmers who have been protesting the corporate cartels that are destroying agricultural production in Holland. 
Now let's move from the world of the, well, actually I have one more, one more point to make on the strategic, which is some comments on the end of an era in the United Kingdom with the death yesterday of Queen Elizabeth II. Now, whatever your views on the queen and the monarchy, I think it's clear that Prince Charles, now King Charles, is a step into a bizarre uh, decline in the conditions for the United Kingdom. Charles is a radical Malthusian, a supporter of radical population reduction, working with the city of London to shut down industry and advance science and technology on behalf of reducing population. He's a babbler. He talks to plants. This is now the king of England and in charge of the Commonwealth nations. And it occurs at the same time we had a, a degeneration in the prime minister's office. Again, whatever Boris Johnson represented, and he was a, a terrible prime minister, it can be assumed that Liz Truss will be worse. So I would urge our viewers and supporters in the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth countries to pay attention to what we're doing and the, the positive events in the world and become a part of that because there's no reason for us to have to suffer under the insane strategic doctrines being put forward by the city of London, Wall Street, Brussels, and so on. Now, just to a couple of positive notes, uh, we reported yesterday on the Vladivostok Eastern uh, Economic Forum. This is part of an ongoing series of events which are put, pulling together a potential new monetary system based on investment in physical economy and cooperation among nations as opposed to neoliberal austerity and geopolitical confrontation. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization will have a meeting on September 15th and 16th. This will be attended by Putin and Xi Jinping. There's a BRICS summit coming up, and yesterday the Argentine president applied for membership in the BRICS. I think the BRICS represent the kind of positive uh, alternative that reflects the ideas and work of the lifetime of Lyndon LaRouche. And this is something we, we should, again, insist that Western governments, instead of confronting the idea of Eurasian integration and Asian development as a threat should embrace it and become a part of it because this is the potential to break out of the war and economic lunacy that's being imposed on much of the world's population. Coming to the question for Friday, many, many people are saying, well, what can be done? How can we change this? How do we break the power of the media? How do we take power away from people such as Blinken and, and Sullivan and the Boris Johnsons and Liz Trusses and the Zelenskys? How is that something that's possible? Well, we've had a series of events leading into this weekend where we'll have an international online conference, which will take up the questions of how we do solve this problem of a collapsing global economy and a danger of nuclear World War III. It's centered around the idea that we need to break with the geopolitical axioms of the empire, which is collapsing, and instead embrace the idea of development is the new name of peace, as stated by Pope Paul VI back in the 60s. And what that means is cooperation among sovereign nations for an economic system that benefits the people of sovereign countries as opposed to looting them to defend the wealth of the speculative elite represented in global corporations, especially financial institutions. So I would call your attention to several things. On September 7th, the Executive Intelligence Review sponsored a press conference, a conference titled Shut Down Ukraine Hit List Targeting Americans and International Voices of Opposition. This was a very powerful event with people making passionate appeals to shut down the Committee to Combat Disinformation and the Mirotvoretz website, which are targeting those people who are opposed to this war, opposed to the arming of Ukraine, opposed to the attempt to weaken Russia at the expense of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian nation. 
for saying that. People like myself, like Helga Zeppler-Rusch, Diane Sayre, uh, Scott Ritter, Ray McGovern, and many, many others who spoke at that press conference have been labeled information terrorists and in a sense have been put on a kill list. This is something that, as Scott Ritter said, is very, very serious. The Washington Post had a story yesterday describing how Ukraine is sending assassination teams into the Russian-occupied area to kill people who are the so-called occupiers of uh, Ukrainian territory. It reported at least 20 assassinations in grisly detail. But to be put on a list like this, especially after what happened to Daria Dugina in Moscow two weeks ago, is something that, that has to be addressed. And yet Western nations, 24 of them, were present on September 1st and 2nd when the lunatic Shapovalov, who runs this committee, said that Ukraine is committed to a policy of combating this, including taking people who are identified as information terrorists, putting them on trial as war criminals with the intent to liquidate them. As Mirotvedet's website said they did with Dugina. So the press conference on, on Wednesday, on September 7th, is on the Schiller Institute website. You can watch it and spread it, circulate it, share it, get this information out. Why is the U.S. government funding hit squads in Ukraine that are targeting Americans, American patriots such as Scott Ritter, such as Senator Rand Paul? What was Rand Paul's crime? He said, let's find out where this money is going. We're going to send $60 billion into a black hole in Ukraine and not have an inspector general? For that, he was labeled an information terrorist. Tulsi Gabbard, who said we should negotiate, not arm, is an information terrorist. My specific crime was going on Iranian television and saying that it's the Ukrainian people who are the victims of this NATO policy. I was actually defending the people of Ukraine from your own puppet government, which is killing you on behalf of NATO. For that, I'm described as an information terrorist. So look at the press conference to give you a sense of how we can fight this. Then yesterday, uh, September 8th, was a tribute to the 100th birthday of Lyndon LaRouche, the triumph of truth. And again, you can go to the Schiller Institute website and see the streaming of incredible videos over 50 years of Lyndon LaRouche's interventions and insights and solutions when it comes to overcoming the insanity of the last 50 years. Then finally, we have an online conference Saturday and Sunday, the 10th and the 11th, under the title, Inspiring Humanity to Survive the Greatest Crisis in World History. The first panel begins at 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday, and it's on the topic of how to inspire humanity with a keynote address from Helga Zeppler-Rusch. The second panel begins at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I will be the moderator of that panel. The title is Defend the Right to Deliberate. Speak out against blacklists and the suppression of the search for truth. Because what these hit lists are doing is trying to have a chilling effect on anyone who would oppose the narrative, which is that we have to suffer so that Ukrainians can be killed in the mission of degrading Russia. So that's the second panel beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Then on Sunday at 10 a.m., we'll have the third panel, which will be on presenting the LaRouche Library, a discussion of what we're doing to make available the incredible work, the lifetime of work of Lyndon LaRouche. And then panel four, and this is one which is really important, the art of optimism, using the classical principle to change the world. To, to attend this conference online, go to schillerinstitute.com, where you can also find the press conference from Wednesday and the videos from the tribute to Lyndon LaRouche as he turned 100 years old, uh, or the 100th year anniversary of, of his birth. I would simply conclude by saying that for those of you who seriously ask the question, can anything be done? 
Become part of the fight. Nothing can be done if you sit there in awe at the insane power wielded by the corrupt oligarchs of the financial establishment and the corporate cartels. But something can be done if you show people what it is that's targeting them. What is the direction? Where, where is it coming from that's telling them you have no power? I think the demonstration in Prague on Saturday showed something. Just as if you look back a mere 30 something years ago to the toppling of the East German communist regime by the people, not by a military, not by great powers, but the people who showed up Monday nights at churches in Eastern Germany and eventually became so large that the government of the communist dictatorship collapsed. People have power. You don't have power if you sit there trying to convince everyone that all the power is on the other side. And you don't have power if you're waiting for some so-called force of white hats to come in and sweep away evil. Each of us has a role to play, and each of us must play that role today if we're to save civilization at this moment of its greatest crisis. So I hope to see you at the uh, conference tomorrow, and that's my report for today.